Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us at the Progressive Forum. We're the world's only expressly progressive lecture series, and we're based in Houston, Texas. I'm Randall Morton, founder of the Progressive Forum. And during this pandemic, we're learning to do new things. Now producing free live, st live stream events is with one of my favorite people, Robert Reich, a prime mover of today's progressive movement. I'll interview Secretary Reich for about 25 minutes. Then the recording will be available on our website indefinitely, starting tomorrow at progressiveforumhouston.org. That's progressiveforumhouston.org. Please sign up to get announcements at our website, or you can also make a donation if you wish. Our live stream events are free, so we can reach a large worldwide audience. I thank our sponsor, event sponsor, Mary Kubansky and Don Griffin for their generosity, supporting our leap into this brave new world of live streaming. I think I should note that I've paid for my own haircut, by the way, and I'm not taking a $70,000 deduction for it. <laughs> Makes you crazy. <laughs> We estimate today's online event may produce almost a ton of carbon. The Progressive Forum has made a donation to the Texas Coastal Exchange, which sequesters carbon and protects marshland along the Gulf Coast. Secretary Reich and I will be discussing his timely and important new book called The System, Who Rigged It, How We Fix It. I'll hold up a copy. This is a fast read, it's cogent to the point, and I hope that Biden-Harris make it a, make it their handbook. To get a copy, you can click the link under the screen to purchase Robert Reich's book for a 15% discount for Independent Bookshop, Houston's Blue Willow Bookshop, who is, they're also donating proceeds to the Progressive Forum. The book link is also on our website and the 15% discount will be available for two weeks. Robert Reich was the 22nd Secretary of Labor during the Clinton administration. He's co-founder of Inequality Media and a professor of public policy at the University of California in Berkeley. Time Magazine named him among the 10 best cabinet members of the century. To me, he's the leading voice defining the language of a generational progressive movement. Please welcome Robert Reich. Secretary Rice, thank you for joining us and congratulations on your new book. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Randall. And, uh, and thank you everybody who's joining us. Uh, thank you, Houston uh, and progressives everywhere. Um, let's dive right into your book, which says, quote, forget politics between Democrats and Republicans. Think power. Why do you say that? Think power. Uh, because, uh, Randall, it really is right now all about power. Um, the real uh, political controversy deep down in this country uh, that's been emerging over the last 40 years, and I think Donald Trump is just the culmination of it, uh, is not so much Democrats versus Republicans or right versus left. Uh, it really is democracy versus uh, oligarchy. That is, and I'm using oligarchy in terms of the old Greek word, uh, that is great wealth and great power in the hands of a very few people. That's what's happened in the United States over the past 40 years. Um, most of the gains from economic growth have gone to a smaller and smaller number of people. And we now know that the richest one-tenth of 1% 1 has almost as much wealth as the entire bottom 90% put together. Uh, and wealth means power. And that power means the ability to continuously change and reorganize the market itself to gain even more wealth and power. Uh, you say 40 years. What, what happened over the last 40 years? Uh, well, for one thing, we saw in the late 1970s, early 1980s, a fundamental change in American capitalism. Uh, and that change was from what might be called stakeholder capitalism, in which big corporations 
uh, really did feel and act uh, out a responsibility to all of their constituents, not just their shareholders, but also their workers, their communities, their environment, to a different form of capitalism, which is fundamentally shareholder capitalism, in which big corporations uh, were committed and required by Wall Street to do whatever they could possibly do to maximize shareholder returns. Now, the catalyst for this was both Ronald Reagan and the Reagan administration, but it was also the corporate raiders of the 1980s who demanded that corporations make shareholder value the one value and the one goal that those corporations were tending to, which meant that starting then, corporations fired workers, uh, replaced workers with machinery, outsourced abroad, uh, fought unions, busted unions, did everything they possibly could to maximize shareholder returns at the expense of every other stakeholder. Uh, so it's not surprising that most of the economic gains over the past 40 years have come essentially out of the pockets of working class and poor Americans. Uh, the bottom 80% really uh, and the only people who have gained are people who have lots of shares of stock. Uh, the top 1%, the richest 1% of Americans, owns half of the entire stock market right now. The richest 10% of Americans owns 92% of the stock market. Well, the stock market is certainly not American. Uh, why did the United States take this direction in starting in the 1970s, and other nations around the world continue to maintain their, their middle class? Well, I think that we did it, uh, in, and it's, it's a vicious cycle. Uh, and I, I was there at the time. I was in government and out of government. My first uh, job was uh, as an intern in the Senate office of Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, that's how old I am. Uh, and I remember uh, the changes that started to occur. Uh, I then had a job in the Carter administration. And by the way, today is Jimmy Carter's 96th birthday. Talk about a, somebody who distinguished themselves and really has the moral character of a, of a president and, a, and an ex-president like nobody else we've actually ever experienced. Uh, I wanna salute Jimmy Carter. Uh, but what I saw was increasing amounts of money moving into American politics. No other country allows this degree of wealth and money to affect political decision making. Uh, it started in the late 70s, increased in the 1980s. Uh, by the time I was Secretary of Labor for Bill Clinton, uh, I was amazed, uh, quite really shocked at the extent to which big money uh, was even in a democratic administration uh, was was seemed to be calling a lot of the shots. Much of that money coming from Wall Street. And are there two or three meaningful steps our democracy could take to get money out of politics? After all, at Citizens United. This is uh, the Supreme Court said it was okay. Had, what are the concrete steps to get money out of politics? Well, uh, the first uh, step is going to be the most difficult, and that is to reverse Citizens United. It doesn't look like a Supreme Court uh, in my lifetime is going to be doing that. Uh, but uh, and, and getting a constitutional amendment is very, very difficult, as it should be. Uh, but that is one important step. Another one, though, even if we don't reverse Citizens United, by, through the court or a constitutional amendment. Another is to do what uh, is in actually already being proposed by the House of Representatives in H.R. 1, the first bill to come out of this current House of Representatives, uh, which is matching uh, public money uh, for every small donation, that is under $200. Uh, there is a, a proposal in which uh, people can check off on their tax returns that they want some of that money to go into a public fund to support candidates that will only take money from small donors. We've had something like this before, but I, this is much more ambitious. I think this is very important. Also ending the, uh, the, the revolving door 
uh, between business and government, particularly with regard to people who are going to be overseeing the industries that they have something to do with in their regular careers. Uh, there are many things that can be done, Randall, uh, and I've just begun with them. We also have to uh, make sure that every dollar spent on a campaign or indirectly on a campaign uh, is transparent, is uh, revealed to the public, uh, that, that there is uh, full disclosure. Uh, that's possible, and uh, we're not that far away from it, but we've, not, we've got to have a Congress uh, willing to pass this kind of legislation. I'd like to stay on the topic of politics for a moment. We just uh, got through a hellish debate a couple of nights ago. I noticed that. Uh, I mean, hellish yeah. is, a, is, a, is a kind adjective uh, to describe that debate. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I felt degraded and sullied uh, just watching that. And really, it's not a matter of uh, kind of this false equivalence. Uh, I read the headlines. I mean, Donald Trump, let's be very, very clear about it. Uh, Donald Trump was outrageous, was completely out of control, was, was, was acting like, you know, a, a, a 13 year old or a 12 year old. Uh, it was the most unpresidential uh, kind of uh, debate. It wasn't even a debate. Uh, Joe Biden was trying to respond, uh, was responding to uh, the camera, ultimately, rather than to Donald Trump. But this was, this, uh, I'm not going to engage in false equivalency. I think Donald Trump just demonstrated a character uh, that we all know already, but it was, uh, it was disgusting. Frankly, it was just disgusting. We were talking earlier, and I, I think the word pornographic accounts for the, the feeling of feeling solid and degraded. Um, but you're, your book, you know, um, solving this middle class, class, class crisis can help reduce polarization. Um, Morning Joe this week, they presented some interesting polls, which they couldn't figure out. But I think you're, I think you put your finger on the answer. In 1968, George Wallace got 13% support. Today, Donald Trump gets 41%. Uh, your view of what happened over the last 40 years in solving this polarization crisis through rebalancing the economics made a lot of sense to me. Well, when we talk about rebalancing the economics, let's be clear what we're talking about. Over the past 40 years, the median wage, that is the wage of the person smack in the middle of the wage ladder, has not increased at all adjusted for inflation, which means uh, that the typical worker today, uh, even before the pandemic, was earning basically no more than he or she did in 1980. I mean, uh, this is extraordinary. I mean, I, I as Secretary of Labor uh, in the 1990s, I went out to the Midwest and to the Rust Belt and to the Middle West, uh, to the South, uh, kept on talking to people. And people were, even at that time, uh, told me, uh, look, I'm working harder than ever. I'm playing by the rules, but I'm not getting ahead. And I'm feeling angry. Uh, I then repeated when I did research for this, uh, my most recent book, The System, uh, I went back to many of these same communities in the Midwest and the South and uh, in North Carolina and in South Carolina, elsewhere. And, and I asked some of the same people and their children about how they were doing, what they were feeling. Uh, and they were angrier than they were before. Uh, this was in 2015. I asked them who they were thinking about supporting. And I kept on getting back the following response. We are very interested in either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. And at first, uh, I couldn't believe my ears because it seemed to me Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump were on opposite ends of the human species. But what people told me when I got into discussions with them about this is that they felt that the system was so rigged against them by big corporations, by Wall Street, by the very wealthy, that they wanted somebody who was gonna shake things up. And I think what happened to many progressives and working class people and some poor people is that they, they, they bought Donald Trump's fake 
uh, portrayal of himself as a kind of a, a, a hero, a tribune of the working class, uh, of the people who are not being listened to. Now, there was obviously a lot of racism in Donald Trump's campaign as well, but I think that to miss this point that Donald Trump presented himself, he was obviously, and, and we now know he was a Trojan horse uh, for the oligarchy. I mean, he gave the oligarchy, has given them everything they wanted in terms of tax cuts and regulatory rollbacks on health and safety and the environment and labor law. But nevertheless, at that point in time, in 2016, he created the impression he was against, he was anti-establishment. And I think that's why many people in 2016 went for him. Hopefully, they now see the light. Hopefully, people understand who voted for him in 2016 that this was a con job. It is a con man. But my point is that for 40 years, we've seen the increasing frustration and anger of a large number of Americans who, with good reason, feel that the game is rigged against them. And it is rigged against them. Uh, some of your critics say you're a leftist calling for socialism. How do you respond to that socialism charge? Uh, well, I, socialism is a charge that has been made against, I mean, Franklin D. Roosevelt, when he came up with social security, was accused by the Liberty League uh, of being a socialist. I mean, socialism, as Harry Truman said, uh, is what the right continues to complain about Every time there is a president or Congress or anybody comes up with any, any uh, idea that is going to help the middle class and the poor and the working class in America, it's always called socialism. In fact, we have socialism for the rich in this country. Uh, you know, if you are a bank CEO and you screw up royally, you get bailed out. You don't go to prison. Uh, but, and if you are a CEO of a big company and you, you drive the company to the ground, you get a golden parachute uh, worth millions of dollars. Uh, but the average working person in this country uh, doesn't have that kind of socialism. The average working person in this country has the harshest form of capitalism that in, is in existence uh, around the globe. Uh, you know, the, the typical worker in America doesn't have any, any paid sick leave or any paid vacation leave. The typical worker in the United States doesn't have uh, paid health care or a, a pension or, or, or higher education. I mean, most other advanced countries in the world treat their working class well. We treat our working class, and I'm talking not just about, uh, about a sliver of the country, I'm talking about a, a huge number of people, the majority of American workers, uh, from people who are poor up to people who are earning the median wage or even above the median wage. Uh, nobody treats their workers as badly as our workers are being treated. So it's not about, as you say, more government or more or less government. It's about who government is for. Yeah, a very important point uh, that I, I, I try to get across in the book, Randall, <clears throat> is that this age-old debate between do you want the free market or do you want government is, is insane because you can't have a market without rules. And those rules about antitrust, anti-monopoly law, rules about labor law, rules about what is property, what's intellectual property, what can be bought, what can be sold, under what circumstances, bankruptcy laws, all of these rules come from where? They come from government. They come from executives, governors, presidents, they come from courts, they come from legislatures. And so the real issue is not government versus the free market. The real question is, who is in charge of making those rules? Who has the most influence over those rules? And what's happened in this country is that that small group of relatively wealthy people, hugely wealthy, not even relatively, hugely wealthy people and corporations and banks are having and have had more and more influence over making the rules of the game and creating rules that favor themselves. I mean, look at bankruptcy. You know, 30 years ago, it was possible for a homeowner uh, who couldn't 
make a mortgage payment to basically reorganize those payments under the shadow of bankruptcy, if not bankruptcy itself. It was possible for a former student who couldn't meet those student loan obligations to use bankruptcy to reorganize, or in the shadow of bankruptcy, uh, to get creditors to help reorganize. Today, because the big banks change bankruptcy laws, it's not possible for homeowners or former students to use bankruptcy. That's just one example. Throughout the entire organization of the market, we see the influence and power of wealth in the form of individuals and big corporations and big banks to change the rules of the game to their advantage. And that's where the sense of the game being rigged has come from. It's true. Uh, when you were in the Clinton administration, you were a big advocate for making a big investment uh, in the American people. You've advised four American presidents. Let's say Joe Biden and Kamala Harris get elected. What would be your advice to President Biden? Well, the first piece of advice uh, in terms of economics is to understand and act on the principle that public investments in education, infrastructure, job training, in all of the healthcare that is really an investment in the future productivity of our people, and childcare, which is also an investment in the future productivity of our people. All of these investments help grow the economy. They are good for us. They are good for Americans. They make Americans more competitive. They are not just like any other form of, of public spending. They really are investments. They're public investments, and we need to increase them. We have a huge deficit in public investment, and that's the central economic principle. Instead of trickle-down economics, which is what Republicans have used. The idea that you enrich the people at the top and that trickles down to everybody else, it's never worked. It's a hoax, it's a cruel hoax. What you want instead is bottom up economics. You want to invest in our people so our people can be more productive. That is a critical central principle of what should be democratic, <clears throat> capital D or small d economics. And let's talk about local for a moment. Houston is now in an oil bust, as well as a pandemic bust. What, what's your advice to mayors and economic civic leaders in finding opportunities in recovery? Well, look, at the, the first most important thing to understand right now is that this economic crisis we're in is not like the Great Recession starting in 2008, 2009. Uh, it is not like even the Great Depression of the 1930s. This economic crisis we're in is because of a pandemic. And until we contain and constrain and control this pandemic, we are continue. We will continue to have an, have an economic crisis. Uh, so uh, what uh, President Biden, assuming there is going to be a President Biden, has got to do is first and foremost, contain this pandemic. This is something that disgracefully our current president has failed to do. In fact, quite the opposite. The current president has made this pandemic far worse. Uh, now, what do you do as a mayor? Well, as a mayor or a governor, what you've got to do, and it's hard to do, is help people survive through this pandemic, even though a lot of people are not going to be working. This is not an equal opportunity pandemic. It's not an equal opportunity economic crisis. People who are managerial and professional workers, they can work remotely through their computers. That's what we are doing right now. I'm not working, obviously, uh, but you and I are transacting uh, through my laptop and through your laptop. Uh, but only 35% of the American workforce is able to do that. Most workers cannot. And most workers who are in the personal service sector of the economy, and I'm talking about retail and restaurant and hospitality and so on, their jobs are very precarious. Many of them are not coming back. Other workers are in the essential 
so-called essential worker segment of the economy. They are risking their lives in hospitals, in warehouses. They need the best protection possible. They need personal protective equipment. And so we owe it to our own workers to be able to give them the protection they need, both physically and economically. If they cannot work, if they don't have a job, we've got to go back to what we had briefly, and that is much more generous unemployment benefits and also health benefits. This is a national crisis, and we've got to understand it as such. Uh, my last question, Secretary Reich. Um, what is your emotional process for dealing with so much grim news, like the raging fires near your home in California? What are your reasons for hope? Well, let me say this uh, and, and, and tell you this as, as clearly as I can. I, I share a lot of the sense of loss and grief and anger and fear. Uh, that so many Americans now feel. I mean, it, that's, it's rational. I mean, when you think about not only the environment and the wildfires and the floods and the hurricanes, uh, but you also see COVID and you see how difficult it is to constrain it given what the administration is doing. Uh, and you see uh, the violence, uh, particularly violence perpetrated by increasingly a right-wing terrorists. And, and that CIA report that came out uh, just two days ago makes it very clear that most of the violence on our streets is coming from the right. It's not coming from protesters. And then, obviously, you've got Donald Trump. Now, you put that together, and there's not very much good news out there, to say the least. But what gives me hope, Randall, is three things. One, I'm a student of history, and I know there are great cycles in American history. We had the first Gilded Age when we had great inequality, and corruption and poverty. And Americans rose up. After that, we had a progressive era starting in 1901 with Teddy Roosevelt. I think that we're on the verge of another progressive era because people are so outraged. Whether they call themselves Democrats or Republicans or independents, it doesn't matter. And secondly, what gives me hope and confidence is that we've got so many young people and people of color and women who are getting involved in politics as never before. Uh, and there's a kind of political rising tide. I think it somewhat has to do with changing demographics in America, and those demographics are changing. Uh, but we also have a, a degree of political excitement and involvement coming from uh, young people and people of color and women, uh, such as I haven't seen in my lifetime. And thirdly, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for 45 years. I have never taught a generation of college students who are as dedicated, as committed, as absolutely certain of their commitment to the public good and the common good as the students I am now teaching and I have the privilege of teaching. And so for those three reasons, they give me, all of those reasons give me sustenance. Uh, you know, over the short term, I'm nervous, I'm worried, I'm anxious as everybody else is. Over the longer term, I have a great deal of faith in this country and a great deal of faith in our resilience. Thank you, Secretary Reich. It's been a joy to be with you. Uh, good luck with this important book. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Be sure and get the book on our website. It's a uh, it's an inspiring book, like uh, Secretary Reich. Secretary Reich, well, thank you, and uh, and I want to thank you all of the people who attended and everybody uh, who is is out there. Uh, I really appreciate your time and attention. Take good care, Secretary Reich. Now you too, Randall. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.